All right, so we're gonna get started and I'm going to do our DNA extraction lab and I'm gonna, um, you guys can follow along if you want. Now I don't see many cameras on, so if you're not gonna follow along, that's totally fine. I'm just gonna go through the lab and you guys can kind of see what we would have done with the DNA um, extraction with the strawberries. Um, and if you, you know, if you want to, you can try this at any time. You're, um, you're using like household products for this, so that's pretty cool. So this is a lab you could actually do anytime. I'm gonna just grab one ingredient. All right, so need some contact solution because vegans don't often have uh, meat tenderizers in their kitchen and instead I can use some contact solution. All right, so we are going to pull some, oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, we're gonna pull some DNA out of strawberries. All right, so um, this lab, I will post the link to, to the lab itself, um, but it gives you step-by-step -step instructions here. All right, so it says the first thing you need to find something that contains DNA, but since DNA is the blueprint for life, literally everything contains DNA. So we often don't think about the fact that when you're eating, these are frozen strawberries. Frozen strawberries, for some reason, give a much better yield, I think just because they're like um, mushy. Um, so anything you eat, and we often don't think this, but like when you're eating strawberries, when you're eating a salad, when you're eating even pasta, you're eating those cells and you've got, um, you've got DNA inside of every single one of those cells. All right. So DNA is the blueprint of life and every living thing contains DNA. So speaking of which, if you guys haven't yet checked out the notes for, um, for the, the lab, or I'm sorry, for the notes for, for DNA, um, I would recommend doing that because um, I did post them there, you know, 90 minutes long, but you can take breaks. Um, and that way you'll be, you won't have missed a lecture. So last week with the, with the Zoom class, that was just rough, but those notes are on YouTube. I did post the YouTube link. So you can watch those and all that information, it's just like missing a lecture in, you know, in class. Um, you, you kind of, if you don't do the notes and you kind of lose some of that uh, explanation, but your textbook does a good job. So just make sure you're getting that information in however you need to. All right, so, um, so DNA is in every living thing and every one, one of your trillions of cells and every living thing cells. Okay, so certain sources, um, of, of plants have a lot more DNA because they have something called polyploidy. Um, so strawberries are an example of that. If you remember from the notes, if you watched them, most live, most, um, well, not most, but like for humans, for example, we're what we call a uh, diploid or diploid, meaning we have 23 pairs of chromosomes and each pair has two chromosomes in it. So that's two times 23 pairs with a total of 46. Strawberries have many chromosomes per pair. All right, so they are uh, what we call polyploidy. So what that means is that they have a lot of DNA and a lot of different um, fruits and vegetables have that condition of being polyploid. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna blend up um, the strawberries. So, this is about half a cup of strawberries, but you can kind of uh, play with the measurements a little bit. So you're gonna blend up about half a cup of strawberries. So let me just get some supplies here. My dogs heard the, the drawers opening and they think that they're getting food. All right, so we're gonna put the strawberries into here. Just use a blender. I'm using our, our Ninja blender. All right, and then it says, I'm just following along with this recipe. Um, here, I'll put the link 
in the chat if you want to um, follow along. All right, so then I'm gonna add an eighth of a teaspoon of table salt. Now, unfortunately, the only thing I have is um, pink Himalayan sea salt, which is a little bit coarser. So let me see if you can see here. But the, the pink salt, it's a little bit more coarse. So hopefully this works okay. So an eighth of a teaspoon is like a really, really small measurement. Let's see, we got a quarter teaspoon. So I'm gonna take half of a quarter of a teaspoon because most people don't have eighth teaspoons in their kitchen. Maybe you do, maybe you're a baker. All right, eighth of a teaspoon of salt and then one cup of cold water. All right, cup of cold water. I feel like I'm on a cooking show. All right, then it says blend on high for 15 seconds. The blender is actually separating the strawberry cells from each other. So it's man, and the salt, think about the salt as like, you know, salt is sharp. So it's like little jagged edges and it's breaking apart all of those organized cells. If you guys think back to when we saw the onion cells under the microscope, they're like tight little boxes. It looks like a grid. So what you're doing is you're mixing this together with salt. You're mixing those, those grids together with salt to break apart the cells. Because step one of getting DNA out of the nucleus, out of the cell, is to break apart the cell, all right? So this is gonna be loud, so just one second. All right, that was about 15 seconds. So now we've got our strawberry, strawberry soup here, all right. So now it says, pull, pour your, so this in the, um, in the lab, if you're following along, it refers to peas. So they are using split peas. I'm using strawberries because I've done this for years and years and years using strawberries. Um, but you could use spinach as well. All right, so it says pour your uh, thin strawberry soup through a strainer into another container like a measuring cup. So I'm going to use the same measuring cup. And I'm going to use just a little sieve. Now, if you have um, cheesecloth, if you guys know what cheesecloth is, um, if you have cheesecloth, that's going to be even a finer mesh, so it's even better. Um, you could use also a, um, like if you have an old t-shirt laying around, you can use that as well. But we're just going to use this just to get the chunks of strawberry out. Try not to make a mess here. And it, it works out perfectly to use the... Um, the measuring cup that you just used because you just added a cup of water and so you're just going to have a little bit of extra. My dogs really think that they're going to get like a good treat here. They're literally just standing next to me. Do you hear their little feet on my floor? All right. Made a little bit of a mess, but that's okay. Science is messy, right? All right, so now it says you're going to add two tablespoons of liquid detergent and swirl to mix. So I'm gonna use dish soap, all right? So you can use any dish soap. You could use, um, you know, actually like laundry detergent. I should show you my dogs. Okay, hold on. Do you see them? Just standing there waiting for treats, wagging their tails, being cute. Hi, puppas. Yeah, that's my cuties. The <laughs> Puppies, the works, the perks of working from home. I had it, it. I don't know what it's gonna look like though when I do come back to like actually having to leave the house for work because they are gonna be distraught. 
because the amount of attention that they get every day is ridiculous. Right, pups? I know. All right, so we're gonna do two tablespoons of soap. All right. So it's a little bit, um, it says to swirl to mix, but uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, um, I'm just gonna use my spoon and just kind of manually stir it a little bit because my soap was a little bit thicker. All right, so very gently stir it. So what you're doing when you're adding soap is if we think about this, the cell membrane is made of phospholipids. Phospholipids don't like water. So if I add soap in, which is another substance that like, you, you remember we talked about how fat can break apart, or I'm sorry, soap can break apart fat cells that normally congregate when they're in water. When you add soap, it pulls apart the soap or the, the fat bubbles that form, like if you're trying to clean a pot or a pan with oil or grease in it. Well, think about instead of the fat bubbles, we're trying to break apart the cell membranes, which have the same kind of um, chemical structure. They don't like water. So by adding the soap in, I, and I'm just stirring it around very gently, all right, by adding the, the soap in, I am further breaking apart the cell membranes that we just blended apart and broke, broke into, all right? So, so now we've got, so now we've got our, our soapy mixture. So it says pour the mixture into two test tubes or other small glass containers. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't keep test tubes at home. I mean, I am a science professor, but maybe, so maybe I should start, but I don't at this point. So I'm gonna just use little salad dressing containers. All right, so like little Tupperware, and it says uh, about one third full each. So just take a look here. Gonna make a big mess. I'm never good at pouring out of these. Oh, about a third. Okay, there we go. So pour the mixture into test tubes. All right, so then I don't know why it's um has I did two. Um let's see how many. It doesn't really say how many test tubes, but I'm just gonna do two. All right. So then it says, add a pinch of enzymes, which would be, <laughs> yeah, you should have a microscope and a test tube collection at home. Everybody should. Um, and Brooke, I think you at the end of class need to show us your new puppy because that's phenomenal. Um, all right. So it says, add a pinch of enzymes from meat tenderizer to the test tubes and gently stir. Be careful. If you stir too hard, you're going to break up the DNA because now the cell membrane has been broken apart. And now we've started to break apart the nucleus, which is also that same kind of membrane. All right, but we don't wanna break apart the, the DNA. Um, it says, if you can't find meat tenderizer, which again, we're vegan, so we don't have meat tenderizer laying around, but you could use pineapple juice, which is another really good option, or contact lens solution. So I've never tried this with contact lens solution. So if this epically fails, I do apologize. But if you have meat tenderizer, try that. So we're just gonna, Add in some contact solution. And I'm kind of just eyeballing this. There's no amount listed here. All right. So, um, and then we're going to stir gently. So I'm just going to very gently use my spoon and just stir in. All right. Now I don't know how it's going to work with the contact solution but we will find out. All right, so then it says, um, tilt your, your test tube and slowly pour rubbing alcohol into the test tube down the side so that it forms a layer on top of the strawberry mixture. Pour until you have about the same amount of alcohol in the test tube as the pea mixture. So one trick that I always do is I keep this very, I put the uh, rubbing alcohol on ice. Um, when it's cold, it works better. So 
So this is a little bit cold. So I just added it a little bit ago. All right, so you're gonna tilt this. And you're just gonna pour this in. And if you can see, you're starting to get like a separation there. Okay. And the reason you're using alcohol is that alcohol is less dense than water. So it's gonna float to the, to the top. And anything that would have been floating to the top of the strawberry mixture is now gonna float to the top or to the, the middle layer between the strawberry mixture and the alcohol, all right? So if we let this sit for a few minutes, we should start to see um, some stringy, like a stringy white substance appear. So again, never done this with the contact solution, but we're gonna, we're gonna see how it goes. So I'm gonna let that sit for a few minutes. And while we're doing that, does anybody have any questions about the notes or anything, which I know most of you probably didn't watch yet, um, about the notes or anything with DNA or anything you saw in the chapter? Any questions I can answer, you can type them into your chat window or you can raise your hand if you would like. Nobody, nobody. That's good, no questions. All right, um, well, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna try and screen share here. Um, let's see. I want to show you a, um, a lab, where did it go? The extra credit thing was insane, like insanely long, a lot to do. Yes, I know. But that's why it was, a, it was a, a scale. You could do as much or as little as you wanted to. You could do nothing. Um, did you learn from it? <laughs> the whole point was to learn a little bit, right? Um, okay, so I'm gonna show you. <laughs> Didn't have time to do it. I know, it's, it's tough. Um, but that's okay, that's why it's extra credit. It's not mandatory, right? <laughs> Whoa, sorry, that's, my dogs don't like that sound either. So I wanna show you this uh, cloning activity because your textbook talks a lot about cloning um, and biotechnology. So I'm gonna just run through this with you and we can kind of do this activity together. So let me see here, screen share, share. Do you actually see my screen now? Yes, with the mouse. Why is this not? All right, there we go. So sorry for the obnoxious sound. Okay, all right. So it says using what you know about somatic cell nuclear transfer. That's in the PowerPoint, um, SCNT, and it's also in the textbook unit. So I thought that this was very fitting. Um, so this is the process that they use for cloning. Okay, so it says, let's try it out. Your mission is to create a genetically identical clone of Mimi, a brown female mouse. So she makes this obnoxious sound when you click. Woo All right, so let's click Mimi and see what happens. It says, oh my goodness, that is exceptionally loud. Okay, welcome to the mouse cloning lab. Here you will find all of the tools you'll need to, oh my God, Katie, that's not even funny. <laughs> I was like, it can't be the karate schedule because that's not even my desktop this time. I did figure out I had a setting wrong because I, I was using our <laughs> I was using our desktop and I usually don't use that for a screen share and it was a setting. So my bad. All right. So it says here you will find all the tools you will need to clone Mimi. Okay, so here we see Mimi is a mouse we will clone. She's a brown mouse. Meg Doe, an egg cell donor, she's a black mouse. Momi, a surrogate mother to grow the Mimi clone and she's a white mouse. So we're gonna use a microscope, Petri dishes, a sharp pipette, 
uh, blunt pipette and chemical to stimulate cell division, which we would in this instance call mitosis. All right, so let, it says first let's examine the steps. First we're going to, and this is all in your textbook as well. First we're going to isolate, wow, there's just bouncing everywhere, there we go. Isolate the donor cells from Mimi and Megdo. So we're taking the DNA from Mimi and we're taking an empty cell from Megdo. Second, we're gonna remove and discard the nucleus from the egg cell. So we don't want Megdo's DNA. So in order to get rid of her DNA, we have to get rid of where the, the DNA is being stored in the cell, which is the nucleus. Third, transfer the somatic cell nucleus in. So the somatic, somatic means like body cell. So all of our cells are somatic except for our gametes, which are sperm and egg. All right, so when you see that word somatic, it means body. The root word soma refers to body. Okay, so somatic cells would be like a muscle cell, skin cell, you know, a hair cell, all of that nerve cell, that would be somatic cells. So everything except for sperm and egg. All right, so it says transfer the somatic cell nucleus into the enucleated nucleated egg cell. So the egg cell without its nucleus. Okay. Then it says, oh, my screen has you guys there. There we go. Uh, stimulate cell division. Implant the embryo into Momi, the surrogate mother. Deliver the baby mouse clone, Mimi. All right. So let's take a look at step one. Remove, click and drag, drag a somatic cell from Mimi and an egg cell. So we're going to take Mimi's egg uh, somatic cell, put it in a Petri dish, and then we're going to take the egg cell. All right. Now remove and discard the nucleus from the egg cell. So we don't, so we're going to use this egg cell, put it onto the microscope. This is actually how they would do it, just a little bit more cartoony. And we're going to use the microscope lens, hold the egg with the blunt pipette. Okay. So we're going to, and that is going to apply a mild suction. All right, now suck the egg cell nucleus with the sharp pipette, removing the nucleus from the egg, and that's enucleate. I can't say that word today. Enucleation. All right, so we're going to use the sharp pipette, go in, suck out the nucleus. So now you have an egg cell with all of the egg cell goodness that you need to develop a, a growing embryo. You have all of that extra cytoplasm. It's the right size. It has all the nutrients, all the right organelles, all those extra mitochondria in it, but it doesn't have the, the nucleus. So you're, you're good. All right. So now it says move the enucleated egg cell from the Petri dish under the microscope to the nuclear transfer dish. Okay. So we're going to move the egg cell to the nuclear transfer dish. Now we're going to move Mimi's somatic cell to the transfer dish. We will now transfer the nucleus from the somatic cell into the enucleated uh, egg cell. Move it to the microscope. So this, the DNA in the Mimi cell, we're going to put it into the egg cell. And then remember, the goal is to get an exact clone of Mimi. All right, use the microscope lens. Hold the somatic cell with the blunt pipette to, hold, to create some, some suction. Hold it in place. Remove the somatic cell's nucleus with the sharp pipette. And this is, unfortunately, you can damage the nucleus a little bit here. All right. And then you're going to put it into, there you go. And this is also, um, this is also how they do, uh, oh, there's an egg timer. Now that you've substituted the egg cell's nucleus with the nucleus from a different cell type, the new DNA and the egg cell need some time to adjust with one another. Essentially, the DNA needs to be rebooted or reprogrammed to behave as though it were the DNA of an egg cell. This is going to take a couple of hours. Um, so this is also this process with the, the pipette and pulling the, the, you know, thing, putting things and pulling things out of a cell. This is how they would do um, uh, in fertilization of a cell. So for like IVF and vitro fertilization, stuff like that, they can actually take a sperm and implant it into, into an egg. So you might've seen this process before of like looking at an egg under a microscope and you see a pipette go in and put in something and that's usually in vitro fertilization. Um, so what this, this slide is talking about here, and that I mentioned this in the notes, when they clone something, they have to, um, 
re wait for the DNA to reprogram because essentially as you're going throughout your life, things happen to turn genes on and off. Um, this process is known as epigenetics, meaning you're not fully like the decisions you make in life do impact your DNA. All right. So certain things can turn certain genes on and off. So if you're looking at an adult cell, okay, and the DNA in that adult cell, it's going to have certain genes turned on and off from things that occurred in that uh, organism's lifetime. And also certain genes for growth will be turned off. So the example I gave in the notes was, you know, if you were to look at your bone cells, most of your bone cells are, are fully grown and fused. Um, well, with, with certain exceptions for, because most of you are under 25, you do still have some, um, like for example, your, your sternum still has some growth occurring, but, um, you would take the, you know, the bone cells in, in adult bones don't have the growth genes turned on as much as let's say a kid, a kid's bone cells, those genes for growth are constantly on because they're growing. Your bone cells are constantly remodeling. All right. So it's a different gene set. So if they were to take the, the cell from you and put it into this, this egg cell without the nucleus, the genes would still be shut off for growth. So, but the, uh, the beauty is with epigenetics, if I put that, that DNA from an adult into an egg cell, the surrounding environment of the egg cell is actually going to trigger the genes in that DNA to turn back on because we put them in the right environment. All right, so DNA, it's been, it, this is still being understood and still being studied, but DNA put in different environments will act differently. So we're putting it into this egg environment and it's acting like it's egg DNA, all right? So here we go, um, proceed to the next step. Okay, where am I going? Proceed to the next step. Oh, the little arrow that's blinking at me, okay. So now we're going to stimulate cell division, okay? So now you need to stimulate mitosis to occur in the Petri dish. To do this, you're gonna add a drop of a liquid that mimics the cellular events that occur when an egg cell is fertilized by a sperm cell from a male mouse. All right, so you're gonna pull this dropper over here, add the chemical. That's gonna give the cells the signal that it needs to start growing and creating more and more. Now, if you remember at this point, okay, it says, wait until the cell is divided a few times, creating a ball or a marola of 16 cells in the Petri dish. This normally takes several hours, but again, in our case, we're gonna fast forward. So if we think based on our notes and based on what we've learned from our, our sun gauge work, every time before a cell can divide and do this process, it has to create more DNA. It has to do DNA replication, which we learned about in our notes. So um, it has to create an exact copy of the DNA. Because if I have that cell that I just created with the, the, the cloned DNA put into the egg, and that, that does mitosis and cell division, and it makes now two cells, well, if I didn't copy all the DNA, this cell would have no DNA, right? So before I do that, I have to do DNA replication. So DNA replication happens before the cell divides, before it goes through mitosis, all right? Now we're gonna implant the embryo into our surrogate mom, Momi. All right, this at this point, um, Marulo, it would be uh, an embryo. So we're going to take that embryo and you would only, this is again, this is the same kind of situation with IVF, except you're not using clone DNA but you would take this and you would implant into Momi, all right, into her uterus. The embryo continues to increase in cell number, so it, mitosis is happening, you know, nonstop. Um, and the cells begin to differentiate into various tissues. So as more and more cells start to form in the embryo, that sends a signal to those cells to start to become specialized. So you're gonna start to have digestive system cells form, nervous system, cardiac system or cardiovascular system, those cells will start to diverge and become different. And that's known as cell differentiation, All right? The pregnancy will continue on for only about 19 days. So mice only have a little gestation period. All right, so mommy's gonna deliver. Boom, look at that, baby mouse. Okay, so you've created a baby mouse, which is called a pup. 
uh, clone of Mimi. What color do you think this mouse pup will be? Well, if Mimi gave us the somatic cell, she's the donor. Megdo gave us the egg. Momi was the surrogate mom. But remember, you took the DNA from Mimi. All right. So Mimi is brown. So her baby, her pup is going to be brown. Because the pup's genetic material came from Mimi, she too is a brown mouse. Why don't we call her Mini Mimi? All right. Did this really happen? Yes. The procedure that you just completed is actually based on the research protocol that was used in one of several landmark experiments on cloning in 1998. So we're going back 20 years, 22 years here. Scientists at the University of Hawaii made mice genetically identical to the mouse from which a cumulus donor cell was taken. The firstborn survivor was named Cum Cumulina. The scientists learned that allowing between one and six hours for the newly transferred nucleus to adjust to the enucleated egg cell was crucial before activating the cell to successfully develop into an embryo. So before adding that mitosis chemical, they let it sit for a little while and that seemed to be the trick. All right, let's see. So that is our cloning experiment, okay? Any questions on that? You can type them in the chat or you can raise your hand if you would like. Cool. All right, so I wanna show you one more thing, but let's check on our, our egg cells first, so or not our egg cells, our strawberry, our strawberry stuff. All right, so I don't know if you can see this. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can get like a better background on it. So different background lighting. No, still kind of weird. What you can see is there's actually like cloudy stuff that's formed and that is the DNA. So I'm gonna take a straw and I'm gonna start to uh, pull this DNA out a little bit. So usually you can use, if you have a toothpick or anything like that. All right, so we're looking at the DNA here. And if I use a toothpick, you get a little bit of better success. So you, can you guys see the like stuff sticking to the end of the toothpick? Yeah, that's the DNA, all right? So the DNA, is Tommy, yes, I did get it, you're good. <laughs> All right, so the DNA is here and there, there's a lot of it. So like, if you can see, there's just this cloudy mixture on the top, that is all DNA. And as I gather this, if I kind of like spin this around, so you can do this at home, you get more and more of it to kind of clump together and spool around the, the toothpick. All right, so it's a little bit better on the darker background maybe. So that's all DNA, all right? So we just extracted all this DNA literally by just blending it up with some ingredients and getting and uh, using the toothpick to pull this out. So you can see it here against the dark background of my shirt maybe, all right? See the, the layer? So this is all the strawberry stuff. This in the middle, this cloudy stuff, that's the DNA and the alcohol is floating on the top. All right, so if I do, if I get another toothpick and check this one out. All right, so again, just kind of spooling this around and you get that stuff. Wish I had like a top down one so you could see it all, but it's all in there. All right, that's your DNA. That's the strawberry's DNA. There's a lot of it. Very cool. All right. So we're going to do one more little um, virtual activity, and then I'm going to 
send you a digital one that um, a virtual lab that you can do and fill out um, just some questions that go with it, which is which are pretty basic. So, okay, let me go back to Chrome here. So I actually wanted to do this one because um, it deals with something that you may have heard of right now, um, which is called PCR. So if you did do the extra credit, um, you probably heard about this process, which is called PCR, which is stands for polymerase chain reaction. And this is actually how they are, um, well, one of the, the, the preliminary tests that they were doing on people to see if they had COVID-19, they were actually utilizing a PCR test. All right, so it's actually a very current, um, current term that we hear on the news and um, you know in our articles if anybody's reading anything and if you did the extra credit um, assignment you may have heard them talk about it depending how far you went in the um, in the the things that you guys were wa or listening to the podcast all right so let me just share the screen again with you here hold on Sorry, it takes me a minute. Share screen. Here we go. Share. All right. So we are looking at, can you guys see my screen okay? All right. So we're looking at this PCR reaction, okay? So it says, um, and now if you do this at home or if you have anything, I can send you the link in the chat. You do need flash player. So I'm just gonna send that to you. Um, but uh, if you have that, you're, you're good. All right, so it says PC PCR, short for polymerase chain reaction, is a relatively simple and inexpensive tool that you can use to focus in on a segment of DNA and copy it billions of times over. PCR is used every day to diagnose diseases, identify bacteria and viruses, which is what we've been using it for lately, match criminal, criminals to crime scenes, and in many other ways. Step up to the virtual lab bench and see how it works. So PCR is actually how, um, so if you think about it, in the notes and in your textbook, they discussed how everybody's Human's DNA is 99.9% .9 identical. So let's say you have crime scene DNA and you're trying to figure out if um, a person was the, you know, the, the, the uh, criminal at, from a crime. You could take one person's DNA, a second person's DNA, a third person's DNA, any of your suspects, and then take your, the one that you found at the crime scene and you could look at the segments that we know in humans are different and you would be able to match to the the crime scene dna it would take forever if we did the whole dna sequence because there's so many base pairs and we know specifically in humans which gene segments are usually different in people all right and so that's how we can utilize this stuff same thing is going to go for viruses so in order for them to get enough DNA or enough uh, RNA in this case from the um, virus, they do this polymerase chain reaction. And if you remember, polymerase was an enzyme. We talked about DNA polymerase. Well, there's RNA polymerase as well. Polymerase, ASE means it's an enzyme. And here, let me see if I can um, annotate for you. I'm not sure. Okay, if we remember, Okay, so polymerase, all right? ASE means enzyme, and a polymer is a large molecule like DNA or RNA or a carbohydrate or a lipid or a protein. So we're making, we're, this enzyme is making a large molecule, okay? So what um, polymerase is doing in this polymerase chain reaction is it's going in, finding a specific segment of DNA or RNA, and it's going to make a ton of copies of it. 
so that in, think about like sample size instead of just working on one little sample and possibly losing it okay like if you have a crime scene dna you can't damage that little tiny piece that you have you're better off making a bunch of copies of the original so that you can play around with them and experiment and not damage the original so the same thing with this you make a ton of copies of it and then you can investigate with those copies all right so let's see here um pcr we're gonna do begin all right so here it says the human genome i'm just gonna try and move my there we go the human genome is made up of three billion chemical base pairs so three billion scientists often need to isolate a very specific segment of dna from within a vast amount of genetic material since this segment is just one tiny piece of the genome, they need many copies to have enough to work with. All right, so many copies so they can see what they're working with. Now we're gonna apply this to our um, virus DNA as well, our virus RNA. All right, so here we are. The polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, can generate 100 billion 100 billion identical copies of a specific DNA sequence in a matter of hours. So this is what they're doing with the virus. They took a sample of the virus and people in legit hazmat suits are the ones doing this, right? They took a sample, they put it in with the PCR reaction and they were able to make 100 billion identical copies of the virus DNA so that they could work with it and sequence it. As the inventor of PCR explained, the technique requires no more than a test tube, a few simple reagents, which are just little chemicals, and a source of heat. All right, so let's say you're looking at a sample of hair. To perform a PCR reaction, you need DNA that has been extracted from cells. Because the purpose of PCR is to make more DNA copies, you don't need very much DNA to start the reaction. For example, you could extract DNA from a small sample of blood, skin, saliva, or even hair follicles. So like for crime scene investigation, this is really important. All right, so here we are looking at a hair follicle. So it says, start by moving your extracted DNA into the special PCR tube. PCR works by heating and cooling the solution over and over, so PCR tubes are designed for even heat distribution. Okay, so we're going to take, drag the extracted PCR, or I'm sorry, the extracted DNA, and we're going to release it into our PCR tube. Okay, and this is what scientists are doing right now as we speak with the COVID-19. They're just continuing to investigate, see if there's any mutations, which we, since it's come to the US, we've already had two um, mutations, which means the gene sequence is changing. All right, so next add primer one to the PCR tubes. If you remember from the notes, there are primers which will link, which will attach to certain segments of DNA. So like if the DNA is A, A, T, C, then the primer is gonna be T-A-G, all right? Did I do that right? Yes. Okay, so primers attach to sites on the DNA strands that are at either end of the segment you want to copy. They are powerful tools for copying very specific DNA sequences since there's almost no chance that they will get, uh, since they will target the wrong site. So there's almost no chance that they're gonna to go to the wrong piece of DNA. So let's say we know that, let's say we're looking at, um, to see if somebody has the gene for um, Huntington's disease. Well, we know where the gene is, all right? And we know that prior to that gene, there's a segment that is AAATCA. We're gonna use the primer in this specific PCR reaction that matches that segment, all right? Because then we know it's like a you are here. You wanna look right here so that you can see this, the Huntington's disease gene right past that, all right? So this is a little tricky with DNA segments that you don't know or RNA like in the virus, but we know that you know the, the genetic makeup of these viruses is usually blah, 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 and we're looking for one specific sequence to be different. All right, so you're gonna add primer one. So these, this like blue tool here that I'm using is a micro pipette, and it's using very tiny microliter amounts. So not milliliter, microliter. All right, so very small amounts. So 
um, cause you only need a little bit in this little test tube. You're working with a small amount of extracted DNA. Now add primer two, which is gonna attack, attach to a second site. So just like we did with the first one, we're gonna put in primer two. All right. Oops. Okay. Sorry if you guys see the manage participants thing. There we go. Okay. All right. So drag the nucleotides to the PCR2. So if we want to make 100 billion copies of this section of DNA, then we need to make sure that all of our um, we have free nucleotides to build it up out of, all right? So you can't just like make the DNA out of nothing. You have to have free nucleotides to make, to, to make that big polymer, all right? P a polymerase has to have something to work with. So we take a bunch of adenines, guanines, cytosines, and if it's viral DNA, a lot of times we're using something called uracil instead of thymine, all right? Um, so we're gonna take our free nucleotides, put them into our, oops, drag it over to our PCR tube. So now we've got the free nucleotides for the polymerase to work with. So now you're gonna add your polymerase to the PCR tube. DNA polymerase molecules act like tiny machines that read the DNA code and then attach matching nucleotides to create DNA copies. This particular DNA polymerase has been specific, or specially selected to withstand the high heat of the PCR reaction. So this is a, a fun fact is that the polymerase that we use for PCR was actually discovered in um, vents, underwater hydrothermal vents in the bottom of the ocean where, you can, where they can withstand crazy high amounts of, of heat. So they extracted the polymerase that organisms in the bottom of the, in those hydrothermal vents, like the bacteria, archaea bacteria in those bottom thermal vents, it's super hot because it's, it's coming up from the core of the earth from the, you know, the heat. Um, they extracted the polymerase that the bacteria uses for its natural uh, DNA replication. And that's the one that we use because it can, it can withstand high heat. All right. So we're gonna take our polymerase, we're gonna add it to our test tube or our, our micro tube here. Now that the PCR tube is filled with all of the reaction components, you'll place it into a DNA thermal cycler. This machine can precisely heat and cool your tube at specific times during the next hour. These changes in temperature are crucial for making the reaction work. Okay, so we're gonna close up our little micro pipette. We're gonna drag it to our thermocycler and start the thermocycler. All right, so it's gonna show us what's happening in here, which is cool. So here's our section of DNA that we are target sequence or RNA if we're talking about the virus. All right, inside your PCR tube, cycle one has begun. The thermal cycler heats up to 95 degrees Celsius. That's 203 degrees Fahrenheit, which is almost boiling. At this temperature, the DNA double helix separates, creating two single-stranded DNA molecules. So essentially, if you remember, heat denatures proteins. Well, we're doing a similar process here with the DNA. We're heating it up so that the DNA falls apart a little bit, breaks those hydrogen bonds. All right, so now it's unzipped so the molecules are apart. Now the thermal cycler is gonna cool down to 122 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 50 degrees Celsius. At this temperature, single-stranded DNA molecules naturally attempt to pair up. So these two, the top one and the bottom one are gonna try and pair up again, just naturally like magnets. However, there are many more primer sequences than DNA strands in the tube. So the primers crowd their way in and lock onto their target sequences before strands can rejoin. So those primer one and primer two are gonna to attach to those opened up DNA strands before the DNA can reattach. Timing in this is really important. The th thermal cycler is now going to heat up to 72 degrees Celsius, all right, which is uh, in the 100s in Fahrenheit, which activates DNA polymerase. So DNA polymerase is now 
happy with that temperature. Because remember, it's an enzyme, which is a protein, and proteins need specific temperature ranges to work. When DNA polymerase locates a primer attached to a single DNA strand, it begins to add complementary nucleotides onto the strand. It continues until it gets to the end of the strand and falls off. So polymerase is going to go through and read each of these bases one at a time and attach the free nucleotides. So here it goes, does that to both sides. Now you have two copies of that single-stranded DNA that was the original DNA. Cycle one is complete. Click the next button to begin cycle two. So you're going to heat it up. Same three steps happen in cycle two. Temperature is raised again to separate the DNA strands. Primers go in. Temp so we already added all the primers. So this is just you know, giving more primers the chance to do their work. We haven't added anything else. Temperature is lowered, so the primers attach. Polymerase does its magic. And the temperature is raised to stimulate DNA polymerase to copy the strand. So again, this is happening with RNA very similarly if we're talking about uh, RNA viruses. Our viruses can have DNA or RNA, depends on the type of virus. All right, so now we have made, in this depiction, six copies, or we've made four copies of our desired fragments. So during cycle three, your desired products begin to appear. Two strands that begin with the primer one and end with primer two. These are DNA copies, of the, just the segment of DNA you've targeted. Although there are only two desired fragments at this stage, as you continue with these cycles, these products will quickly become the majority. So if we're trying to, if we're trying to figure out what strand or what virus we have here on our hands, we're gonna do this and target a specific sequence that identifies the virus. And now we're going to have many, many copies of it so we can do our work with it. All right, so here you just keep repeat, repeat. At the end of cycle four, you have eight fragments that contain your target sequence. Keep repeating. So this thermocycler is just heating and cooling and heating and cooling. Now you have 22 fragments that contain only your target sequence and only 10 longer length copies. Click the fast forward button to run more cycles. So this just keeps going on. After 30 cycles, there are over a billion fragments that contain only your target sequence and only 60 copies of the longer length molecules. You now have a solution of nearly pure target sequence. So now you can do all of your testing and sequence and figure out what the exact base sequence is of this DNA, and you will be able to test it against anything and compare to what you know compare like for viruses we took you know the um the viruses the virus that caused caused sars all right we took the sars virus we took the mers virus and we took the covid 19 which is the sars cov2 virus and we're comparing these specific sequences the specific target sequence and now we can take the one that we just isolated from the, the sars cov2 or that causes covid 19 and we can see how it's different from SARS, how it's different than MERS. And now what we're doing is we're taking the original DNA or RNA from our SARS-CoV-2. And now since it's mutated twice since being in the United States, we're comparing the mutated viruses and seeing where it specifically it is mutating. All right, so that is our PCR reaction. Okay, and it does go through on that link that I just shared you. Oh, here's the thing about Thermus aquaticus. All right, so the polymerase in our bodies breaks down at temperatures over, you know, in boiling. Um, the DNA polymerase that's used most often in PCR comes from a strain of bacteria called Thermus aquaticus that lives in hot springs of Yellowstone National Park or in our hydrothermal vents. It can survive near boiling temperatures and it works quite well at 162 degrees Fahrenheit, which is what they heat it up to. All right, so there is a description there that kind of just help, helps to further explain everything. Okay, does anybody have any questions? If you do, you can chat them. Nothing, nothing. Does that make any sense? All right, I'm gonna show you one more thing that you're gonna do at home. It's um, another virtual lab, very much like the one we just did. Um, 
Let me go back here. All right, so you are going to be doing, and I'm gonna email this out to you guys as soon as we're done, and this is gonna count as your lab. So that the in the chat, that's the newest, um, newest one. So let me see if I can. Okay, so one second, let me screen share again real quick. All right, so this is the worksheet you're gonna fill out. Now it is a PDF. I'm gonna change the lab. Um, I might put it into a Google Doc again. Um, and share it with you that way because the link is actually a little bit wrong. But um, you're gonna go here, which looks just like this, similar to what we just did, and you're gonna start the lab and go through the whole thing. Okay, you're this guy here. All right. Um, and you're going to answer these questions as you go through. It's very simple, um, but it's, it's basically what I did, but in a lab setting. So you're gonna use isopropyl alcohol. I used um, isopropyl alcohol here for our, our experiment. All right, so you're gonna do all of that uh, same kind of stuff. You're just gonna answer the questions and do it virtually. All right, and I will post that on, um, on our announcements page and I will email it as well. All right, does anybody have any questions? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, if you do, you can always email me um, and you can, you know, put them in the chat. Um, in terms of the rest of the week, what we're going to do then, will there be a lab quiz? Um, I'm not going to do a um, as in-depth of a lab quiz this week. We might do something Wednesday uh, utilizing a Google form. So I'll let you know about that. It would be after class on Wednesday though, because um, I wanna make sure that we go over anything if anybody missed this lab. All right, so I will kind of just cover the, the topics that would be on it. And then um, it's a, it would be a quick uh, Google form quiz instead of using Cengage or anything like that. Um, but I still have to kind of play around with that. Uh, any other questions, guys? All right, so for Wednesday, we're going to be doing the next chapter lecture, um, and that is on um, DNA to protein. All right, so we will um, we'll touch base with, with that, but that's gonna be the next chapter in your book. So start looking ahead at that if you want. I will record it, and I am gonna contact Zoom and see if they can extend the 40 minutes because we're an educational institution. If not, we'll have to like break out of that room and. And re, you know, re, uh, enter the same meeting link. Um, but I will play around with that. Um, we could always give GoToMeeting another try. I just didn't have very much success with it that that time. Um, all right, guys. So that's that's it for today. Get the lab, uh, get the lab part done. You have the next two hours to get the lab part. Technically, still in our class time, and get that done by Wednesday. All right, I will put it for Wednesday night for that to be done, all right? If you have any questions, just email me, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day, and those of you who are still working and everything, stay safe, stay healthy, wash your hands, do all that fun stuff. All right, guys, I will uh, talk to you soon. Bye.